live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about better luck next time, SpaceX, and of course, taking listener questions about all things in this amazing universe. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can follow along online or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about learning how to die in space but first the news hey space cadets welcome to space radio i'm paul sutter astrophysicist at stony brook university and the flat iron institute and for the next half hour you're Agent to the Stars. We've got an exciting show for you today. Trust me, this is going to be an action-packed episode. You're going to love it. The show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com to get your question on the air or... You can join our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including, but not limited to, Howell, New Jersey, Portsmouth, UK, Washington, D.C., Halifax, England, Tucson, Arizona, love Tucson, Hutto, Texas, Fairfield, Montana, Kempner, Texas, San Francisco, California, and Yucca Valley, California, and coming in at the last second, Denham Springs, Louisiana. That's so cool. Oh, man, Tucson, I had a good time. I... I was on a book tour there a year ago, and I did a bit with an improv comedy troupe in Tucson, and where, I don't know, it was hilarious. It was one of the most hilarious evenings of my life. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I will take questions that you send there, too. Seriously, folks, I've prepped less than 10 minutes to show material, so get those questions in. All of the shows are action-packed. That's right, Constellation Pigs. It's great to see you again, Space Cadets. So sorry it's been... I've been a little bit uh, on the DL for the past few weeks. We had technical issues a couple weeks ago. Uh, YouTube was just freaking out, and I couldn't run the show. And then last week I was traveling, and so I couldn't I couldn't do the show because I was uh, in a car. And kind of hard. I suppose I could do the show from a car, but that would not be safe. So thank you so much for your patience. Good to be back. Um, I did not find evidence of a fourth dimension. Um, Good to have all the space cadets back. Fayetteville, Arkansas, Dumas, Mississippi. And get your questions in. I'm going to do, I've got so many voicemails lined up that I'm going to be pretty leaning. I'm going to be leaning in heavily on the voicemails this week, but don't worry. I'll get some space to get questions in. Thank you again, Nancy Graziano for wrangling all those amazing space cadets. I need a timer. Where's my timer? I need to know. Cause this is for radio. This is for real stuff. We have ad breaks and everything. It's, it's just how it goes. It's just how it goes. Where's my timer. I'm not prepared. Oh, I'm so amateur about this. How do you guys even stand me? Before I start taking calls, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And wow, what a busy week. So Wednesday was the hoped for launch of the SpaceX NASA mission to the International Space Station carrying two astronauts. The first time in over nine years that we have launched astronauts from the surface of America. Uh, For the past nine years, we've been renting spots on Soyuz spacecraft launched from Kazakhstan. So a little bit nice of a homecoming. There's also a bunch of firsts that were supposed to happen Wednesday. This was a private company in mission control, leading the launch. This was NASA paying a private company. Hey, private company, SpaceX, by the way, why don't you send our two guys up to the space station? The private company saying, sure, let's do it. So this was on a Falcon 9 rocket with the Dragon capsule actually carrying the astronauts and what would carry them to the International Space Station. It was going to be the first crewed launch of a reusable rocket. So after the Falcon 9 did the dirty work of getting the crew dragon up into space, it would come back down and then land on a barge in the middle of the Atlantic. And then we could polish it up, refill it, and send a couple more astronauts if we wanted to. All of this didn't happen. (laughs) 
wah, wah. But it's okay because it was because of weather. There's some nasty weather happening down in Florida, which is typical for this time of year. The launch was scrubbed with 15 minutes to go. If you weren't watching, I don't know, there were like a million live streams and a, a million news outlets covering it. I was live with the Weather Channel starting at three o'clock to cover the launch. So I was right there. I was I was prepping like my lines. I knew what I was going to say. And then wah, launch was launch was scrubbed and I stuck around and I still answered all the reporters questions. It was really good. It has been rescheduled for this Saturday, uh, May 30th at 3.22 p.m. Eastern, if I remember right. I will be back on the Weather Channel starting at 3 o'clock, so 3 to 4 o'clock. I will be on the Weather Channel to cover the launch presume launch hopeful launch i really hope it's a go this time if not we got another window sunday we have these very precise windows by the way these are called instantaneous launch windows because they're going to a specific destination they're not just going in orbit they're going to the space station the space station is moving so it's like if you're on a road trip to seattle and if Seattle were moving around, you would have to leave at just the right time in order to catch Seattle at just the right distance. So you didn't overshoot it. You didn't go too far left or too far right. You hit it exactly where you wanted to be. Uh, so imagine if you're headed on a road trip to Seattle, but Seattle keeps moving around. So you have to launch at just the right time. So we will try again on Saturday, and if that doesn't work, we'll try again on Sunday. And then there are more launch windows. The International Space Station orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, so there will be plenty of chances to, to get it right. And we want it to go right. We don't want any explosions. We don't want any disasters. Uh, we want a successful launch because it'll be a big deal. It'll be nice. Okay. It will just be something nice. Can we get one thing nice? It's been on short supply the past few months. I'd like a nice thing. That's the latest and greatest when it comes to space. But for now, it's time to have a conversation. All right. Something nice, man. Why can't we just... This is why we can't have nice things because of coronavirus. Hate it when Seattle keeps moving. Yeah, I'm like, hey guys, you want to go to Seattle? And I was like, I don't know. It's it's been it's been really erratic recently. Don't know if we'll be able to catch it. All right, like I said, I got a bunch of voicemails, so many good ones. I need to play catch up. Let's do this. We've got some voicemails ready to go. And man, I've got so many on backlog here because we had a couple weeks uh, that we had to take off due to some technical issues and some traveling. But we're back. We are live. We are talking about space. And let's hit a question right away. Greg, cue it up, set the record, and hit the button. Hey, Paul. This is Pia from Copenhagen. I'm wondering what is up and down in this new study from Anita, when NASA scientists supposedly found possible evidence of a parallel universe. It sounds nutters to me. Can you please explain? Thank you. All right. Great question, Pia. And yeah, your first reaction is like, this sounds weird and crazy that we've found direct evidence for a parallel universe where time flows backwards. It's, hmm, that's a bit much to swallow. And, and you may have caught this news over the past week where a scientist running an experiment in Antarctica, and this sounds like something straight out of a Lovecraft novel, um, run an experiment in Antarctica and we found evidence or particles emanating from a parallel universe where time flows backwards. And it's just like, what? When did that happen? Who, what, what? Here's some backstory. Here's some backstory. There's an experiment in Antarctica called ANITA. It stands for something. I can't remember at the moment, but it's all capital letters, so it stands for something. And it is a balloon experiment. So it floats really high altitude over Antarctica. It's a neutrino experiment. It looks for uh, neutrinos hitting the Antarctic ice sheet. And when they hit the Antarctic ice sheet, they give a flash of light and some sprays of radiation. And Anita can see that spray of radiation. The 
last, uh, Anita runs every couple of years and during one of the more recent runs, actually way back, I think in like 2016, they found some high energy particles they couldn't quite explain. They were like much more energetic than we had thought neutrinos could be. And they were coming from weird directions. So we weren't exactly sure what was going on. And then that was it. Anitas never saw those kind of particles again. None of our other neutrino experiments ever saw anything like it. No, none of our experiments at Antarctica ever saw anything like it. What ifs, just chuck it up, another, you know, enduring mystery of the universe. Still, you might be curious why there are these extra energetic neutrinos floating around. And it, uh, over the years, a bunch of theorists have tossed around a bunch of ideas. One of those ideas, and if you give theorists enough time, they will start to get a little bit unhinged, if you know what I mean. One of those ideas was like, maybe there's a parallel universe uh, where time flows backwards and if it intersects with ours, it can spray out some high energy neutrinos. Okay, whatever. It's an idea, I guess. Uh, It fits the data, kind of, sort of, I guess, because it was designed from the ground up to to fit the data. And thank you, Nancy Nancy Graziano, on the the Wrangler of the Space Cadets. Anita is Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna. Thank you so much for digging that up for me. So here's here's where it went from, okay, normal science, someone's popped out a weird idea, happens all the time and no big deal, to uh, internet sensation. And that happened when a news story came out about it, about a paper that was written a year ago, but finally the news story came out on a particular website, which I'm not going to name. The website put most of the article behind a paywall, but just put the title in like the opening two paragraphs in above the paywall so you could read it and then you'd pay your dollar and you could see the rest of the story. So in the title, in the first two paragraphs, we're like, yeah, uh, we found evidence for a, a parallel universe where time flows backwards that intersected ours. And here's our proof from this experiment in, our, our, in, in Antarctica. Then behind the paywall, the rest of the article was all the stuff saying, no, this is just some random idea of dozens of random ideas to explain this weird observational fluke. Uh, yes, it was extremely high energy. No, we don't have a really compelling explanation, but yeah, that doesn't mean that this is true. Whatever. That was all behind the paywall. So most other bloggers and news outlets just took the headline, took the first couple paragraphs, rearranged them and repeated the story again and again and again. And then uh, before you know it, the story is spread. And even the authors of the paper are like, wait, no, what? No, no, we didn't say that. What are you talking about? <sighs> so there it is. There it is. Like we didn't find evidence for a parallel universe in this experiment in Antarctica. And all we have is like some neutrinos that are weirdly energetic. Okay. Uh, there's a dozen explanations One of them is the parallel universe, but it's not particularly compelling explanation. And that's it. I don't, that's all I got, folks. That's all I got. That's it. That's it. That's it. I need to take a break. (sighs) Thank you so much for that question, Pia. Uh, I'm Paul Sutter. This is Space Radio. This show is brought to you by you. That's right, you. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can support the show. Also, the Space Cadets, Forrest Sparrow and Matthew DeFleury are doing some super chats over on YouTube where they contribute money along with a comment. Thank you so much for that. And I will see you after the break. Sorry, folks. We didn't. We didn't. We just didn't. I took, Stop getting excited. Pia, I like your, your sense and sensibility. It was... Mm-mm. It wasn't real. All right, but we got more questions. I got more voicemails. Um, I know Space Cadets, you've got a lot of good questions going. Nerdy rodent, gravity's not for it. Okay, good, 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 good. Whew, you guys ask so many good questions. Should I make the show longer? I ask that every episode. 
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got way, like so many cool questions ready to go. But remember, you can join the conversation by leaving an online voicemail or by following the live streams. Go to spaceradioshow.com for all the links. St- kicking us off, we've got AP Burner one on YouTube asking, gravity is not a force. It is an effect. Discuss. <sighs> that was me taking a big breath. So... Guys, general relativity, which is our theory of how gravity works, paints the picture of gravity isn't so much an interaction. It's not like I'm shooting gravity thingies at you and those are interacting with you and then we are somehow drawn together. It's more a picture of the bending and warping of space time. I'm over here doing my thing. I bend and warp space time. You are over there doing your thing, but you have to live in the same universe that I do with the same space time. So if you're encountering a bent space time, your trajectories, your movement is changed. You recognize this as the force of gravity, but really it's the bending and warping of space time. This is in contrast to our knowledge of the other forces, the strong nuclear, the weak nuclear, and the electromagnetic, which do involve interactions of particles, of of shooty things going back and forth, like we're actually forcing each other and interacting with each other in a very like concrete way. We know that our picture through general relativity is incomplete. We know that the story of gravity is not completely written. We know that we do not have a quantum picture of gravity. What this quantum picture of gravity will reveal, we don't know. Will it end up being that gravity is like the other forces and there's shooty things going back and forth boo, 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 to mediate an interaction? Or is it something else? Is it geometry? It, or are all the other forces in some way described by geometry or not? We don't know. We honestly don't know what the next level of understanding of general relativity will bring. That's it. Moving on. Uh, we've got more voicemails. Let's load it up. I like, how about, how about, how about, Greg, play that one. That one. Hi, Paul. This is Jillian. I'm recording this from Lahore in Pakistan. My question is about the finite universe. Basically, as far as I understand, we think of the universe just after the Big Bang as this finite, expanding bubble sphere of a thing. Fast forward to the present, it's a whole lot bigger, and we are some at some arbitrary point inside that sphere, and we see galaxies receding in all directions at more or less the same speed, that new study notwithstanding. But if you were an observer at the edge of this expanding bubble sphere, would you see galaxies just receding in like one direction or a certain uh, direction and not in the others? Somehow that seems wrong to me, but if the universe is finite, it has to have an edge, right? Great question, Jillian. This is very perceptive. Uh, We have a certain understanding, a a little visual of what the Big Bang looks like, of what an expanding universe looks like. And it looks like a ball. It looks like a thing that is getting larger with time. In that we're at the center or near the center or somewhere inside that thing. And that uh, you could travel to the edge of this thing and look outside the universe and ask, what are we expanding into? What's, what's over there? What's past the edge of our bubble? The, uh, the issue that's, that's cropping up here is our use of a metaphor that isn't entirely appropriate. We talk about things like an expanding bubble, uh, expanding universe. We talk about things like a growing bubble of space. It is not like a balloon being blown and getting bigger inside air and that we're somewhere in the balloon. Mm -mm. We are at the center of our observable patch of our universe. That observable patch is a certain size because the universe is only so long and light can only go so fast. So there's a limit to what we can see. Our universe is getting bigger. Every galaxy on average is getting further away from every other galaxy. So you might think, if we're at the center of our bubble, what would happen if we were to go to the edge of our bubble? What would we see there? 
Well, if you were to somehow magically transport yourself to the edge of our observable bubble, what you would see is that you would appear to be at the center of the universe with galaxies expanding away from you and that there would be an edge to your bubble. And then you could go to that edge and you would see in a bubble surrounding you. And then you go to the edge of that bubble and it looks like you're at the center of a new bubble with new edge and you go and this repeats ad infinitum. We're at the center of an observable patch in our universe in three dimensional space. But every single observer says the exact same thing that they are at the center of their observational patch and they're at the center of an expanding bubble. If our universe is truly infinite, then this just goes on forever. But it's possible to have this kind of setup even in a finite universe. Because even though the universe may be finite, it doesn't mean it has to have an edge. That's right. Finite universes don't necessarily have edges. They don't need to have edges if they curve around on themselves. Look at when you look at a ball or a balloon, don't look inside the balloon. Look at the surface of the balloon. The surface of a balloon has no edge, right? There's no stopping, and yet it is finite. It could be that if you could magically transport yourself to the edge of our observable bubble of the universe, find yourself in the center of a new patch of the universe, surrounded on all sides by a bubble, and go to the edge, and then go to the edge, and go to the edge, and then go to the edge, and then go to the edge, you might just end up back where you started. That's if our universe is finite. If it's infinite, you just keep on going. Very good question. Uh, my ultimate reply here to you, Jillian, is that when it comes to the universe, don't think of simple metaphors like an expanding balloon. What I like to think of is just, on average, galaxies are getting farther away from each other with time. That's what the expansion of the universe means. Almost out of time, but I think we got time for one more. Greg, go, 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 go. If dark matter experiences only gravitation and not the electromagnetic pressure, why is it that dark matter is not simply a sphere with no light pressure to counteract visto i love your attitude and i'm i'm glad to hear that you're doing just fine in these uh coronavirus lockdown times so if dark matter only interacts through gravity and doesn't interact with light or the other forces why isn't it just a big ball guess what dark matter does form balls Yes, around our flat Milky Way galaxy with the spiral arms and everything is a giant ball of dark matter and it is a giant ball exactly because it can only interact through gravity. It can't exchange or get rid of angular momentum so it can't compress into a disk and so it stays as a ball. And so you've answered your own question question you're a genius and you didn't even know it uh, thank you so much for all the amazing questions unfortunately we're almost out of time today on space radio but before we go it's time for the blue shift um cosmic will probably be in the spacex event on saturday i'll be live on the weather channel at three starting 3 p.m eastern on the weather channel i'll be helping them do the live coverage and i was there wednesday for the non-event I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And the space cadets who are watching the live stream already know what I'm going to talk about because I've got it sitting right here next to me. I finally have in my hot little hands the hardback edition of my new book, How to Die in Space, A Journey Through Dangerous Astrophysical Phenomena. This book was so much fun to, to write. It's just, I had a blast writing it and I got to do the audiobook version. It was a blast to read. I had a lot of joy in writing this. It is available for pre-order. It's coming out Tuesday, June 2nd. Tuesday, June 2nd, it will be available in bookstores nationwide. 
assuming you can get into a bookstore, but it'll also be available on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble website, Books A Million, IndieBound, all the normal places. It's available for pre-order now. You can get it on Amazon. You can get the Kindle version. You can get the audiobook version, which will be available on Audible. And in that, yes, it is read by me, which makes it, that was just so much fun. You can also get an autographed copy, folks. Yes, I am de devoting this entire segment to hawking my book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. Those will be the plain, boring versions of the book with no inscriptions, no squiggles, no signature, no special notes. It's just the, it's just the words. But if you go to pmsutter.com slash book, that's P-M, M as in Matthew, S-U-T-T-E-R.com slash book, there's a link right there where you can order off my website an autograph copy that I will deliver to you. I won't hand deliver it. I'm going to send it through the mail like a normal person. I will, but you will get an autograph copy off my website. You'll get it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to ship them all on June 2nd. So do it, get an autographed copy. And I do have a few copies in my hands of my first book, Your Place in the Universe. And so while supplies last, you can get both books if you want, uh, but you can still buy Your Place in the Universe off Amazon and Kindle and all that, but you can get both if you want. But right here, How to Die in Space has such an amazing cover. Just buy it for the amazing cover. There is an astronaut getting his face blown off by an exploding sun. What more could you ask in a cover? It's a gorgeous cover. Uh, I hope the, the cover does justice to the contents of the book. That is pmsutter.com slash book to pre-order your autographed copy. Or if you don't care for the autograph, no hard feelings. I understand. We can just do it the old-fashioned way and you can go to Amazon. All right, guys. Wow. Sorry, I didn't get to a lot of Space Guy questions. I really had to catch up. I really had to catch up. Let me do this closing and then we can have a little cheese. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter and this show is brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can contribute. And by the way, my top Patreon contributors are automatically getting free books. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the Space Cadets, and all the fine crew at WCBU Radio and 90.5 FM in Columbus for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern and visit spaceradioshow.com for all the juicy links. And of course, Thanks again, Space Cadets, for listening. See you next, next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission. Where's the cheese? Don't worry, guys. Don't worry. I got you covered. I got you covered. Let's bring Greg over. Hey, Greg. Been a long time. Sorry it's been so long. Sorry it's been so long. Today's cheese, very lovely. Very excited. I got this now. I got this a few weeks ago because I thought I was going to do a, a show, but it's still good. It's sell by uh, February 3rd of 2021. So I don't think it's spoiled. Not making that mistake again. This is from uh, Red Apple Cheese brand. This is Applewood smoked mozzarella. I know. I know. Can you see it or is it too? Is it too bright? Red Apple brand smoked mozzarella. We've got a cheese knife here ready to go. Now I've kept this out of the fridge, hopefully long enough that, uh, you know, cheese is best room temperature. Yes, you can eat cold cheese and yes, I will eat cold cheese, but I, you, whenever possible, get that stuff out of the fridge, bring it to room temperature. Don't worry. It won't hurt you. Oh, wow. Very nice smell right as I open the package. Nice solid block here. Classic like twine design on the sides. Ooh, we got a little bit of fragmentation here. I don't even need the knife, so I'll just kind of pull at that. Look at that gorgeous mozzarella cheese pull right there. Very interesting texture. I don't know if it's just this package, uh, but I do have like a dry side and a moist side. Hopefully it should still be good. I'll try, I'll try both. Let's see. I'm a little bit nervous because of the odd, the contrast and texture, which really shouldn't be there. So I'll just pull it off. It's basically like grown-up string cheese. 
Hmm. Mm hmm. It's a smoky mozzarella, applewood. I'm a sucker for applewood. Cosmic, by the way, uh, I have been in Crete and I believe I consumed an entire, uh, your entire island output of feta for one day. I, be I believe I consumed. I think that's how much I ate. Mm hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite cheeses of all time, but I have a hard time finding it in the st states is uh, scamorza fumata, the smoked scamorza. Uh, this is very, very similar. I could just eat this. It's a very good snacking cheese. I could eat this whole block. Good job, Wisconsin. Mm hmm. Naturally smoked with apple and hardwood, red apple cheese brand. Yeah, I'll eat that all day long. See.